May 13th, 1931, the time of the Great Depression, and in the quiet rural town of Crete, Indiana, during the warm spring weather, Lynetta Putnam and James Thurman Jones welcomed what would be their only child into the world, James Warren Jones. This dark-haired baby boy would later be known by the masses and in the history books as Jim Jones. He would be made infamous by tragically leading 918 of his followers to their deaths. And this would be the biggest mass suicide the world had ever seen. Hi everybody, I'm Casey and this is The Cult Vault and today we're going to be talking about Jim Jones, the People's Temple and the Jonestown Massacre. Born on what many would call the wrong side of the tracks, Jones's entrance into the world was not one of celebration, like most births are. 1931 was the time of the Great Depression and Jim Jones's father was a World War I survivor. He had a limited education and was living with chronic health as a result of mustard gas scarring and a debilitating cough due to damaged lungs. This combination meant that Jones could no longer work. He received cheque from the governments, but it didn't do enough to make ends meet. It was rumoured that Jones was also a mean drunk with ties to the Ku Klux Klan. Spending what little the family had down at the local bars, Lynetta Putnam decided that she would have to go out and find work. She found work in local factories and canneries and soon became the breadwinner of the Jones's family. Lynetta was described by people as strong-willed and hard-working, and even often callous. It was said that she rubbed people up the wrong way. Some of these traits would be passed on to her son in later life. The pair owned farmland, which they struggled to make repayments on, and eventually the bank foreclosed. They lost the farm, and not long after this, they moved just three miles away to the little town of Lynn, 80 miles east of Indianapolis. Next to the tracks in the poor neighbourhood, the family resided in a shack that had no plumbing. This was when little Jim Jones was known around town as the boy who would have hardly any clothes on, be dirty and unkempt. He could often be seen playing alone and crying. I've heard in another podcast named Colts, which is awesome and really informative, so definitely go and check it out, that Jones was actually accepted into a pack of wild dogs and Jones's parents couldn't get close to him when the dogs were around. Not long after the family moved into the Lynn area, the Second World War broke out, and many of the local kids had to say goodbye to fathers, brothers, uncles, cousins, and it was a really turbulent time for the nation. But for little Jim Jones, this was not the case. Jones began to round young people up in the town and invite them to his parents' property, and sometimes into the woods, where he allegedly held meetings standing on a platform preaching to the kids. He would hold funerals for small animals. And he also tried to tell everybody that he could fly. He climbed up onto the pedestal, leaped into the air, fell and broke his arm. Friends of Jones recall how he would lock them in the attic and tell them that they were not allowed to leave. The local kids didn't do what he had asked them to do. He would hit them with sticks. It's said that soon after this, Jones began to realise that he had a real talent for commanding an audience and a knack for utilising the English language. Jones started wandering the neighbourhood wearing strange robes and clothing. And this is when his neighbour, Mrs Myrtle Kennedy, noticed him. Jones had never felt the love of his parents, so it's not surprising that they had never thought to take him to church. Mrs Kennedy decided that she was going to change that and she took Jones along to his first sermon at her Nazarene church, where Kennedy herself was one of the most devout within her congregation. And it was at this young age that Jones witnessed his first official mass along with the phenomenon known as faith healing. Jones had his eyes opened to the power of the church, and from here on out, he carried his Bible with him wherever he went. Jones had also developed an interest in Hitler, Starling and Marxist theories, Communist ideology made sense to Jones, and with his harsh upbringing within the fringes of society, he was adopting more and more and more of these ideals. In 1948, Lynetta left James Jones for another man, 
and her and Jim Jones moved to Richmond, Indiana, into a largely black neighbourhood. Jones began preaching on street corners in his neighbourhood. Many of his messages were those of racial equality and many people were surprised to see a white man in their neighbourhood preaching black rights within their community. Jones came to realise that the Nazarene church didn't really hold all the answers for him that he longed for. And he wanted a more diverse, socially forward-thinking church that was not prejudiced of colour or race. Jones would travel to many different religious gatherings, treating them like taster sessions for his ever-growing appetite for racially diverse gatherings. He realised that to do this, he would need money, so he began working as an orderly at the Richmond Memorial Hospital. During my research of this, I stumbled upon different versions of what Jones was like at that time. In the documentary New Age Cults, a colleague of Jones's talks about how Jones was compassionate and caring toward patients. But another childhood friend spoke of how he would hurt the patients. One friend recounts Jones forcing him to dry shave a whimpering, frail man. And Jones would stand behind his friend whilst he shaved this old man. And he would giggle with a high-pitched laugh at the old man's torment. It was during this time at the hospital that Jones met a young nurse in training named Marceline Baldwin. Marceline came from a very religious home and took her faith very seriously. People who had been treated by Marceline said that she was kind and compassionate, and despite being three years younger than Marceline, Jones pursued her, much to her parents' dismay. Jones graduated early with honours, and at the age of 17, he rolled into Butler University of Indiana. Jim proved his commitment to Marceline and to God, eventually winning the approval of her parents. And in the June of 1949, Jim Jones, aged 18, wed Marceline, aged 22. Despite being married, Marceline being a qualified nurse, and Jim moving on with his further education, their relationship was said to be less than perfect. According to friends, Jim could be verbally abusive towards Marceline, accusing her of being too religious and devoting too much of her time and attention to God instead of to him. It was during this time that Jim's beliefs in social justice began to overtake his belief in God. 19-year-old Jones was reading a lot into social sciences and agreeing a lot with the ideologies of Soviet-style communism. In 1951, aged just 20, Jones and his wife moved to Indianapolis. Jones wondered how he could put his proclivity for the spoken word to good use. He thought about going into law or politics, but instead became a pastor at the local Methodist church. Now that he was in a big city, Jones visited every religious gathering that he could find. He ventured into tent shows and revival meetings. Jones had also taken a very keen interest into the works of Father Divine. All of this exposure aided him well during his own church meetings, and soon his reputation as a preacher was gaining momentum throughout Indianapolis. Jones's work as a pastor did not offer enough financially to him and his wife. He was known to have a side job which actually involved taking imported monkeys from South America door to door and selling them locally. Soon enough, Jones felt as though the Methodist church was also not flexible enough with its stance on race. And so in 1954, 23-year-old Jones created his very first church. It was located in a racially mixed neighbourhood and it was called Community Unity. Jones began putting all of his knowledge and experience to work. He practised faith healings in his church and his parishioners believed it. Sources have said that those who didn't believe would go just for the entertainment of faith healings, saying that it was the best show in town. It was later revealed that Jones actually paid his secretary to sit in a wheelchair and pretend to be paralysed. He then proceeded to tell her to stand and slowly she did. And the audience watched in awe as she took a few shaky steps and slowly but surely began to run through the congregation and the audience went wild. In 1956, with an impressive following, Jones decided to invest further into his church and loaned money for a deposit on a traditional church building. This one shared familiar characteristics with a pitched roof and pews. And again, this building was located in the heart of a racially diverse neighbourhood. He named this church Wings of Deliverance. A paper on the San Diego University website says that, quote, while the name Wings of Deliverance did not last as the name of the church for very long, 
It did survive as the name of the corporate entity to conduct temple business, including its receipts of donations of property and money from church members, end quote. The paper goes on to say that in 1970, Jones would be accused of tax evasion and eventually a church member signing for Jones would liquidate a house, a nursing home, another property and the church building itself. But before all of this could happen, Jones would change the name of the church to the People's Temple. His congregation continued to grow, as did Jones's view on social equality and rights for the impoverished and the oppressed. The word of God became less and less during his preaching, and soon the church established soup kitchens, homeless shelters, and arranged clothing for the poor. His congregation now had white, black, and Hispanic members, and Jones's message was being heard even further and wider than before. At age 27, Jones welcomed his first baby into the world as Marceline gave birth. Taking inspirations from one of Jones' heroes, he named the boy Stephen Gandhi Jones. Soon after this, they adopted a black child and named him Warren Jones Jr. This sent a powerful message into Jones's community and attracted the attention of the media. They were the first and only white couple to adopt a black child in their city. They continued to adopt, and this time, several Korean children. Jones famously donned his family, the Rainbow Family. 1960 marked the new beginning of a new era for Jim Jones. Jones landed a seat on the Human Rights Commission, where he was instrumental in lessening black segregation within the community and made history by being part of a movement that finally abolished things like separate seating areas for black people in cinemas and restaurants. He helped black members of his congregation get jobs and at one point was even admitted to hospital and accidentally taken to a black hospital. Upon refusing to leave and attend a white hospital, the idea of mixed hospitals even came into question. Jones's name was being spoken within the political world on the streets of marginalised communities and also alongside many religious gatherings. His continued presence in the media caused him to become extremely paranoid. He believed that the FBI and CIA were listening in on his congregations, attempting to foil any plan that the People's Temple might have to gain social equality. He spoke frequently of the end of the world, of impending nuclear war. Jones talked to his followers of a dream that he had of a nuclear apocalypse, and it would be in the year of 1962 when Jones would read an article about the nine safest places to survive a nuclear attack. One of these places was Belo Horizonte in Brazil, near Rio de Janeiro. Jones went out to Belo Horizonte to scout an area for a potential place to move his congregation to. The People's Temple would send their money to fund Jones's stay, but his continued absence within the walls of his church meant that numbers started to decline and people would beg him to come home. Friends said that this only fueled his growing God complex and paranoia. Because of this paranoia, Jones did move what remained of his congregation. Not to Brazil, but to Redwood, California in 1964. And in the summer of 1965, 140 people migrated to a newly developed site. Within this community, you would find a medical centre, nursing homes and daycare for children. Soon after, away from the prying eyes of busy Indiana and the media, with members away from families and friends, Jones could begin his true reign of terror, and that would include psychological and physical abuse. Jones developed an inner circle of his most devout followers. He named this group the Planning Commission, and it was made up mainly of women, and all of its members were notably white. These members were young, eager visionaries who all had ideas on how to make the world a better place. The meetings for this group would take place in the early hours of the morning, away from the eyes and ears of the other members of the People's Temple. Those who were members of this group felt honoured and wished to please Jones in any way possible and those who were not a part of the group were unhappy. They felt it was unfair that they had their work unrecognised by Jones and that they were not able to prove themselves further to Jones. This was one of the methods of manipulation that Jones used to cause people around him to want to please him, almost like a divide-and-conquer power play. Another method of control and exploitation within the planning commission was also sleep deprivation. One member said, quote, If or when... A planning commission member had been caught making a questionable or lousy decision, that person would be called to the floor. They had to stand while Jim and the others spoke about that. The person would get confronted and reprimanded and then sit down. 
We'd move on to the next item, and most of the time the confrontation was verbal. A few times it went further. At least one person was beaten. Another time, in the Los Angeles temple, I was asleep in my chair. Jim told me that if I fell asleep again, he'd shoot me, end quote. This was around the time of the first fake suicide. Jones offered wine to members of his planning commission. One member recalls being excited about this because he hadn't seen wine in a long time and being encouraged to drink it by Jones was thrilling. Shortly after enjoying the wine, Jim sat back in his chair and declared that the small group had all just drank poison and would be dead in a matter of minutes. And when nothing happened... Jones explained that he was just testing the loyalties of his group and that they all passed. During the group's time in Redwood, Jones began preaching about free will and sex. Many sources talk about Jones sleeping with many different women and men. He spoke of how people should be allowed to love whoever they want and that it was important to do so because it went against right-wing capitalists and strengthened their cause for social justice. Jones had been quoted as saying, I don't enjoy it, but I'll do it for the cause. Hayes also been quoted saying that some of the women he slept with made his skin crawl, but he had no choice. Eventually, Jones would take a mistress by the name of Carolyn Layton, and although many did not agree with this polygamous behaviour, it did suit the times in parts of America. 1967 sparked the socially transformative Summer of Love movement, where 75,000 people would ascend upon Height Ashbury, San Francisco, talking of love and war and singing along to the number one hit, if you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear a flower in your hair. And although these people sang of love and peace, the messages had social and political undertones of a counterculture to the current Vietnam War. Jones would use this movement to further his own agenda. Using the left-wing movement to become involved in politics, he could supply hundreds of people for rallies, but this meant that Jones would again become a media sensation, causing his paranoia to spike to an all-time high. He began alienating his members from their families and asking them to sign documents admitting to crimes such as murder and child abuse, things that these followers had not done. Some members were asked to prove their loyalty to Jones by signing blank pieces of paper, not knowing how these papers would be used to exploit them in the future. Jones showed his congregation a film of a Jewish concentration camp and explained that this is what the government have planned for his people and that they must, quote, pool all of their resources together, end quote. Members of the planning commission talk about the millions in assets that the People's Temple had as more and more people began to sign over their incomes and inheritance and power of attorney to Jones. He had all of his members' social security and pension details on file. In 1973, Jones proceeded with the first known occurrence of the White Knight. This would become known as a rehearsal for mass suicide, where an announcement would come over the speakers and followers would arm themselves with guns and shovels and wait for an imminent attack, sometimes for days at a time. By the time 1977 came around, Jones was known across the country... His work on social rights and equality had given him a huge reputation, but what was happening behind the closed doors of the People's Temple remained largely unknown to the public. This was until some defectors took to news outlets and magazines to tell their story of Jones and just how people were being brainwashed and exploited and abused. Jones was accused of handing out punishments to his followers. Some spoke of how they were forced to write lines and others talk about corporal punishment with Jones calling followers up one at a time to be publicly humiliated and beaten. Some spoke of how they were forced to write lines, and others say there was corporal punishment, with Jones calling followers up one at a time to be publicly humiliated and beaten. He would go so far as to get other members of the congregation to beat on those being punished, while he stood behind, encouraging the violence and laughing almost maniacally. Once the defectors had told their story, news outlets and the media began a frenzy. Jones's polished reputation was on the line and the People's Temple started to receive pressure from all angles to provide answers on the activities being carried out within their community. Jones would become enraged at the disloyalty of those who had defected. His paranoia at an all-time high. Plans were put in place for the People's Temple to relocate once again and this would be the beginning of the end of this movement. A small scouting group would be the first to travel to Guyana, South America. 
This was the only English-speaking area of South America and the political climate leaned to the left. Jones worked out a deal with the government and after scouting was complete, smaller groups would follow, leaving from various airports to raise as little suspicion as possible. Survivors recall how there was an airplane ride followed by miles in a boat downriver and then a long journey in the back of a flatbed truck. Groups began working 12-hour days of hard labour, clearing out a space in the jungle for the community to grow. Although the labour was intense and the days were long, survivors recall how they could see the fruits of their labour. Everyone was working together for a new and better life. People of all colour, race, background, they all recall being euphoric and seeing the start of the promised utopia coming to life. Some say this was the happiest time of their lives. Once Jones arrived, he filmed every day. He would send the home movies back to America so that friends and family could see what their money was helping to create and what was waiting for them once they had managed to make the journey themselves. He could be seen delivering sermons and spending time with his exotic pet parrot. He promised the people that they could swim, fish and hike as much as they wished. He showed footage of bananas growing right there on the trees. He showed the smiles and happiness of people who were working to build the community. It wouldn't be long until almost 1,000 people would be residing within this small area of Guyana. It was simply called Jonestown. When people arrived, they slowly began to realise that Jones had sold them a bag of lies. There was no swimming, no fishing, and people were forced to work long days without rest. The bananas growing on the trees? Well, turns out they had stickers on and had been brought from neighbouring communities because there was simply too much demand in Jonestown. Jones's son recalls how his dad had began heavy drug use around this time, that he was beginning to act irrationally. White nights were held regularly, public beatings continued, and Jones would keep his congregation up all night to talk about the impending nuclear apocalypse and the government coming for them. People were forced to live in small shacks, all crammed together. In 1978, back in America... Families of those living in Jonestown would create protest flyers, saying their family members were being abused, exploited and held against their will in Guyana. Forward-thinking congressman Leo Ryan decided to act on this information and along with a crew from NBC News, they flew out to Guyana on a fact-finding mission. In the archive footage available on YouTube, Ryan seems content with what he finds in Jonestown. People speak of how they have found a community that accepts them when no one else did, how they have found a place to live, whereas in America they were homeless. There was food and celebration and singing and dancing, Jones delivering speeches which are positively received. It is only later in that night when a cameraman for the news team is handed a note from a man who pleads to be taken back with them that the visiting group start to notice some dark undertones in Jonestown. Eventually, There are 15 defectors in total who have asked to leave Jonestown with the congressman. Jones is filmed saying that people are free to come and go as they please. And with this, the team pack up their belongings and head to the landing strip. What happens next comes with a trigger warning. Jones, back in Jonestown, is enraged at those who have decided to leave him. Orders a group of gunmen to follow the congressman back to the aircraft. When the gunmen arrive, they open fire. And on the 18th of November 1978, lying in the soil just outside of Jonestown, Congressman Ryan was shot dead. Along with NBC correspondent Don Harris, NBC soundman Bob Brown, newspaper photographer Greg Robinson and the People's Temple defector Patty Parks. Jackie Spear, a member of Ryan's team, survived the shooting by lying in the mud and pretending to be dead. She recalls looking down and seeing part of her leg being blown out. She'd been shot five times and had to wait around 22 hours for help. Spear is now a congresswoman, taking the seat that once belonged to her murdered colleague, Leo Ryan. She is a fearless fighter for women's rights and works a lot to advocate for the LGBT community. During the chaos of what followed, some managed to flee Jonestown through the safety of the jungle, but many were not so lucky. The gunmen arrive to inform Jones of the events that unfolded at the Port Kaituma airstrip. And with this, Jones rounds up his followers. He delivers a final sermon and says, quote, The congressman is dead. We've had as much of this world as we're going to get. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. Jones had made the order and this would be the final white night. 
The children were killed first and survivors recall how some children were given punch to drink. Others were forcibly injected. The punch was poisoned this time. And as the children started to die, some of the women with the people's temple began to get frantic and hysterical, screaming and crying, realising this time it was no rehearsal and 300 children were put to death. The punch made its way around the whole of Jonestown. Some accounts say that people drank it willingly and other people say that they were injected against their will. On this day, 908 people would die from cyanide potassium poisoning, 300 of them children. The remaining 10 members were either shot or stabbed, including Jones himself, who was found with a fatal bullet wound. It is kind of suggested that he shot himself, but it is also suggested that a member of Jonestown may have been the one to inflict that fatal bullet wound. Nobody really knows. Leslie Wagner Wilson recalls how she managed to escape that day, saying, quote, I was terrified. I was waiting for a bullet to hit me. She also says, quote, We are all looking for a place of acceptance in this world. End quote. Hiking through 30 miles of thick jungle, Wilson and her three-year-old child managed to live, but several other family members of hers were lost that day in Jonestown. There is archive footage available to watch on YouTube. And I sat down and I watched this archive footage and it is the new streams footage of that day and there's just hours of it. It shows members of Jonestown scarily eyeballing the camera and walking around in silence. There is the occasional sound of muffled talking, but the members of the People's Temple seem to have a vacant look on their face. Groups of people just sort of stand around in small clumps. And there are short interviews with those who have asked to leave. This is some of the only time you hear talking throughout the entire archive footage. And then all of a sudden, the footage just jumps forward. And for a second, it looks like you're looking at piles of clothes on the floor or the aftermath of a weekend festival. Just colours and mess and after a few seconds you realise it's bodies hundreds and hundreds of bodies all lying face down arms around each other strewn across the grass and the mud and the fields people of all different sizes skin colour age height purple sweaters pink black white even the animals had been poisoned the small bodies of dogs can be seen, strewn in between the poor victims of the People's Temple. Along one strip of grass, there is a table with large coloured jugs. Inside these jugs, you can see a thick purple liquid. This is the poisoned punch. Paper cups are thrown all over the place and the footage ends on the only living thing left inside of Jonestown. Jim Jones's exotic pet parrot, looking lost and confused. Using Stephen Hassan's bite model, most of the behaviour, information, thought and emotional control attributes can be applied to the people's temple. With behaviour control, Jones created dependence and obedience by making members sign blank documents and signing over power of attorney, depriving members of seven to nine hours sleep, and he exploited his members financially. With information control, he used information gained in confession sessions against his members, he forbade members to speak to ex-members and critics. With thought control, he instilled the us versus them thinking about a nuclear apocalypse and military attacks and the white knights. With emotional control, he instilled irrational fears about what would happen if members left his church. He shunned members by disobeying him when they would fall asleep or fail a task, and then he would carry out beatings publicly and he would certainly promote feelings of guilt, shame and unworthiness, as well as offer praise and attention. Using the bite model, we can ascertain what level of control this cult had over its members. But given the final result, I think it is safe to say that the cult rests on the 24 to 35 scale, meaning severe, and that lethal or dangerous outcomes may present within this movement. And of course, we know that they did, Bereaved family members would retrieve just under half of the victims when the bodies were flown back to America. The rest would be unclaimed and unidentified and laid to rest in a common grave in Oakland. 
Years later, Jim Jones Jr. would give an interview and he would say that it's better to live for a cause than to die for one. If you find yourself in a cult or know someone who might be, please follow the link in the description for more information on how to get advice and support. If you would like to send me an email, you can on cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at cultvaultpod. Find me on Reddit at cult-vault. Find me on Facebook at The Cult Vault. Find me on YouTube, Tumblr, Instagram at Cult Vault Podcast. I'm Casey and thank you so much for listening.